Hello and welcome to another Archan XP webinar. Uh, this is the third part of our interior design intermediate course and today we are talking about how to handle your project content. My name is Zoltan Tot, I'm the partner manager of uh, Archan XP and also I'm a hobbyist, CAD and modeler. I like to create things in our software so I'm not only going to show you how to do things but I will also explain you a couple of little tricks and tips I picked up along the couple of years I've been using this software. The program we are going to use for those of you who are new to us is Archan XP. That's a family of products targeted for any kind of uh, design related task, whether you are creating cabinetry or uh, making loft conversion or a couple of stories uh, high office building like you see on the screen. Archine has a product for you as well. Now, last time we looked at how to use and uh, edit architectural plans. We mainly discussed how to import JPEGs, uh, PDF documents, DWGs, and IFC file formats. Today is mostly about how to handle the things that you are creating. Because to be honest, when you are uh, working on a project, you are, um, you are creating a bunch of data, right? So you are ending up with a number of surfaces, many objects, many different materials and textures. You might need to know how to handle these things efficiently because for a, for a small project, it might not be a problem, but when you are getting more and more complex, you need to know how to tackle these issues. But I will explain everything as we go on. As always, if you have any, any questions, you can ask them on the right hand side or below the video in the chat bar. In order for you to uh, keep track of what I'm going to show you, I recommend that you take a look at our website, arshanxp.com slash webinars, where you can not only see the upcoming shows, including the one that I'm doing right now. So if I would click, on, click in here, I would watch myself in live. <laughs> But you can also download the files I'm using during the show and you can also download the course guide which is a comprehensive PDF document which shows you everything you need to know. So if you download this content which is all free by the way, then you can follow along and do the same things as I'm doing on my end. So make sure you follow along or uh, if you haven't then complete the previous courses with topics ranging from material editing all the way to loft conversion. And if that's maybe too advanced for you then be sure to check out our um, interior design basic uh, series or if you're more interested in architecture then scroll the way down and you can find relevant courses in architectural design but today what I'm showing you is not particularly interior design related this is a uh, common uh, practices uh, when it comes to Archline so even though the design is going to be an interior design one uh, what I'm going to show you can be applied to any kind of design even if it's not too large the first thing we have to decide or discuss is uh, is how to save your project. Now, this might be a bit trivial, but let me explain. So when you are working on something, then you might need to uh, save your project and the next day you come back and you open it up. Uh, the first thing what I do every day, whenever I open a project is I make a copy of it, I save it. Why do I do that? Because that way I have another version with that day's uh, particular things that I have just created. So let me let me uh, pretend that I just created, I just opened up this project and now I'm making a backup copy, which I can do by going to file, save project as. And if I click save, I end up with this file browser where I can, uh, where I can not only save, but rename my project. So what I would like to do is uh, I'm adding the date, today's date, which is uh, 2020, um, May the 6th, I think. So that way, right away, you made sure that whatever you are doing now today is going to be saved in a backup sort of file. Now, another thing, whenever you are opening up a project, what I like to do, I like to create a set of uh, folders. This is something I do manually. So whenever I have a project, I have a main folder to it. This is the uh, project called Little John, like the one from the uh, from the Robin Hood uh, mythology. And I have a separate folder for my 3D views, the backup archives, the notes, the PDF floor plans, the renders, the wall elevations, and the project files. The project files are always things that you should be logging with the date that you have today. So as long as you are doing that, you can make sure that the things that you are working on would be always saved. So Tomorrow I will be coming back to this project and rename it, resave it with the number seven at the end. So that way every day, start your day with creating a, a new version of the project that you are saving. So that is manual saving. Of, of course, when you are working on your project every now and then you can hit the save button and that way you override the previous uh, things that you saved. How about automatic saving? Now, this is something that the software has 
But this is a huge disclaimer I have to make here. The software has two abilities to save and restore your projects, but you should never rely on these only. So you should always make your own saves or backups. But if you if you ever end up with a difficult situation, then these two methods can be used as a as a as a last ditch effort. So never use these tools as the go to solutions for saving your project. Treat them as a, as an emergency method. That being said, let's first talk about uh, automatic saving. So if you go to the properties down here, uh, the bottom left, and you go to the uh, menu called open and save, then here you can find um, a section which is about save auto recover information. Now, what does this mean? It means that if it's in enabled, the software does, does, make, um, does make a save every five steps. Now, what does that mean? Let's go back to the, soft, the software itself and investigate what happens if I start drawing things. Keep an eye on this part of the screen. So if I go with the wall tool and let's say I want to make uh, an extension for this, uh, for this location, just like that. So I'm just going to draw a few walls, maybe a wall here, another one there, and another one uh, maybe here, and another one there. <clears throat> you see? Right now, at the bottom, the software is saving. So five steps are now gone, and the software just saved. If you want to override how frequently you want the software to save this project, then you can do that over here. Now, five. Is that good or, or not efficient? It depends. For smaller projects, I like to keep this number low, because, you know, you're not doing that many things, so saving is, is very quick. But if you have a large projects with much, much content, then you might want to increase the frequency of the, or decrease the frequency. Anyway, you should you should um, sort of like increase the number. So that means that saving would be done uh, less frequently. That way you are going to save some processing time. If you know in this grammatical context, if I should say increase the frequency or decrease, please let me know. Uh, the point is that you have to increase this number if you want to make the saving less frequent. Now, let me show you when this comes in handy. So let me just uh, go back to the project. And I'm again going to make five steps. Wait until the saving is, is done. So one step here, another step there. Uh, step, step, step. Okay, the saving just happened. Now I'm making one and two other steps. And instead of properly uh, exiting this project, I'm going to pull up the, the task manager and I'm going to manually uh, close the, the software. Like pretend that now we have a power outage and the software just crashes for whatever reason. So that's what I'm simulating now. So the software just just closed down. Okay, so what do I do? I go back to the, uh, to the software itself. I open it up again. So now we are simulating what happens if you lose power or whatever happens. Maybe uh, Meteor just crashed your computer into a million pieces. Well, in that case, it won't help, but you get the idea. So you are uh, opening up our channel again, and we are going to see where we left off. So remember, we did five steps. So now the software tells you, warning, this project is loaded as a result of abnormal termination, which is what I just did on purpose. So what happened is this, that if I hit OK, one, two, three, four, five steps were saved, but the remaining two were not. And that is because that is how the automated saving is set up. So I had five increments. So whatever happened before the last saving would be saved, but everything else would be lost. So the point is, if this happens and you restore the project like that, you should always, again, save your project. Uh, I'm now going to get rid of these walls and, uh, and because I don't need them, fit the screen and save the project again. Maybe it would make sense to make another copy of this project. Depends which is better for your purposes. So that is a uh, fail safe option number one when the software tries to sort of um, save what you have lost. Now, there's another tool which is called the backup, backup archive. And again, please don't believe that this is something that you can use instead of uh, real saving. This is for uh, restoring things that you might lost. Here's how it works. Um, first, let's go to the properties and that way I can show you where you can set up where things are safe. So if you go to open and save, again, we have already been here before. Let's look at backup archive. First of all, uh, we need to enable to create the backups. Uh, daily backups have to be created if I have this uh, checkbox uh, and, you know, you know, enable, then the daily archives would be done. Um, if an archive piece is older than 12 weeks, again, you can change that. 
they would be automa automatically deleted. Now, that is all fine and interesting, but the question is, where are these things stored? Now, that's a good question. If you go to your file browser, I'm going to open up a new one, and you go to your um, documents and watch an XP draw, here, there should be a folder that you might not see because it's, it's by default hidden, it's called archive. And if you go to the relevant year, 2020, and you find today's date, uh, 2020 May the 6th, then you see the projects that you are currently working on. So this is the project, Little John Living Room, today's date. Here we go. So this has two um, files at the moment. One is what I opened up in the beginning, and then another one which I'm working on right now. So whenever you are working on a project, there should be always three pieces of uh, saves. One is where you started, and the two is the is the last two saves the software is making. Instead of over explaining this, let me tell you how these things work. So let's go back to the software. So this is where we are now. Let's make a save, and I'm going to make uh, two additional things here. I'm going to draw another wall like that, and maybe another wall like like this. Okay. So now I'm going to exit the software without saving this project. And what I want to know is how I will be able to restore this without, you know, if I haven't saved it. So I'm going to quit without saving and open up the project again, or open up Archline first. And we get to know the tool that we call Drawing Recovery Manager. And that is a very good tool, but again, this is a last ditch effort. We only use this if uh, something happened and you know, you lost your project, you want to know how to recover it. There's a tool for that, but you have to be careful about not to rely on this solely. So we restored the project, but you know, that's not the last thing I, I, uh, I did. So I'm just going to go to uh, File, Tools, and Drawing Recovery Manager. And this is a tool which is able to read and access your, uh, your archived uh, drawings. But how do I find this thing? So first of all, I need to look for something which was in the name of my project. I know that the name uh, Little was in it. So it was, I think it was a uh, Little uh, John, like that. So search, well, what is this even? I'm, I'm not sure about that. We have to know, we have to get more familiar with this dialogue. First of all, you need to know where you want to look for. I'm looking for in the I'm looking in the backup files or the archive directory. I'm going to have to use the archive directory and hit search again. And now I ended up with a file folder which might be interesting Ali, familiar to you because these are the folders that we have uh, we have showed you before in the um, in the file browser. So these are the archives that the software created for you again, one which was the the starting uh, position and the two latest saves. So I'm just going to click on the the second one, the software tells you its current uh, details, and if I go um, open, then there should be a notification about that the, that the file is named, and if I go quick without saving, yes, I'm sure I want to close this, then the software will, will restore the last thing which was archived. You might lose a couple of steps here, but at least you end up with the project. Now it looks the, the same, but you get the idea. So at least you ended up with something that the software is able to restore. So I hope that uh, that clears up this part. But again, there are two things in the software which are able to help you restore your project, but uh, none of them should be used as a first line defense. Uh, treat them more like um, a backup, a safety backup. That That's why it's, it's named like that. So let's now look at something else, what we, what we use for um, not only saving your project, but instead handling the project content. And that is done with something that we call uh, layers. Now, when it comes to layers, you might already be familiar with this, but let me just make a quick run through that. So Archon XP is a CAD software, and like any other CAD software, it's operating with a lot of layers. Now, when you see something like this, you might you know, freak out and think that this is something that you would never understand. Why do we have so many things? Well, whenever you open up a project, Archon opens up a few layers with it, but you can obviously filter down to the layers that you're actually using, and there's not too many. So you only have things on the object layer, the slab and the wall layers. So illustrating that, if you want to enable and, and toggle the project content, you can go down here to the layer walk and you can enable and disable the things that you actually want, want to show and you want to hide. For example, I want to toggle the walls, 
uh, maybe I don't need them, I want to toggle the, the slabs, then that's how uh, you can do that. In, in fact, let me just do that and build up the whole project without uh, these layers. So if I build it up, I see that I ended up with a room without any walls, but all the content is in there. So that is a very effective way to filter the project content. However, you need to know how to create additional layers. Now, why would you want to do that? That is because sometimes you want to move things to another layer or let me go one step further. Sometimes you want to create layer variations, which would show you different versions of the same project. Now, let's discuss how that works. So first, let me go back to layer manager and, uh, and rebuild everything. So making sure that I have everything enabled. So here we go. Let me just rebuild this, this real quick and get familiar with how to handle the layers. So if I go to the layer manager, uh, I need to go to the layers that I'm using, uh, all the layers, not the ones I'm using, but all the layers. And here I have all the layers the software has created. Let's say that I want to have a layer which is called um, interior um, dining and dimensions, for example, because I have, I have a couple of layers for interior uh, dining and interior living room. But what I like to do is to create a couple of layers for every room I have. Now here I only have one room, but half of it is a dining area and half of it is a uh, is a living room. So I need to effectively toggle between the layers of these of these elements. So let's just go to the add new layer, and I'm just going to say um, interior dining. Ooh, let's call it uh, annotation. Just like that, hit enter and the layer is created. Now, what I want to do now is I want to create variations of my project because I don't want to show everything. I want to toggle between things that I want to show or want to hide at the moment. So I'm going to explain all the light bulbs and, and lockets here uh, or the padlocks. Uh, let's just first create something that we call uh, layer variations. I'm just have to going, going to have to click on this plus icon and I ended up with something that we call a gr new group. But first, let me just rename this. This one shall be named, uh, what shall be the name? Uh, this should be named uh, furnishing -ing plan. There should be another one that we are going to name uh, lighting plan. And there should be another one which is called, um, what should be the name? Dimensions dimensions plus the whole project content. Uh, so now I have four variations, all the layers, dimensions plus plus the plan, furnishing plan, lighting plan. That's, that's fine. Now, here's where the dint of work comes. First of all, I need to know where these things are because if I highlight the chairs and the content, I see that they are all belonging to object layer and that's not good because I want to be able to effectively toggle between the two rooms layers. So if I go now to the layer walk and I find the, the object, then I see that uh, all these things are going to be disappearing and, and that's, not, that's not what I need. I want to be able to toggle between these things. So what do I do? I highlight the elements I want to work with, just like that. And then when everything is selected, I go to the property grid here and I'm going to go with another uh, layer. So this should be interior dining and furnishing. And the remaining things here, that should be going to another layer, which, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm holding control key and highlighting elements. So all the content here, I think even the, the carpet, desk, and the decorative elements, uh, they should be going to another layer, which we will call, um, is everything selected? Uh, maybe the, the curtains as well, because they are belonging to furnishing, even though they are soft furnishing. Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, instead of the object, I'm going to go interior living room furnishing. It just takes a second because uh, the software needs to move all these things. So what did I achieve with that? Yeah, let's discuss. Let's uh, see. If I go to the layer manager and I enable and disable the interior dining furnishing and the interior living room furnishing, then I see that things are toggled back and forth. Instead, let's go one step further and add the lighting elements to the relevant layers. This takes a bit longer, but it's it makes sense to do. Um, you might you might ask, do you always have to do that by hand? Well, when you create something, the software puts things automatically in, uh, on a, on a layer, but you might want to override that, right? So you want to you want to say that this element should not only go to an object or a lighting layer; it should go instead 
the designated interior living room lighting layer because otherwise they are just going to be ending up with the same on the same layers and that is not good for the purposes so let's say that these three elements are going to another layer and that is going to be interior uh, dining and lighting let me just real quick check what I just did so I can toggle this back and forth marvelous so let's go back to the where we actually started the layer manager and here I have a couple of uh, sort of options the the groups uh, I think one one thing is missing and that is dimensions let me just add that real quick so if I want to measure up my building I go to dimension or walls uh, highlight the whole drawing and now I ending up like that so here we go I have the dimensions now it's time to organize the content into layer groups again so let's go back here here's what happens when I look at my groups, I see that, well, they are actually containing the same layers. So what gives? Well, that's the point. They are containing the same layers. However, you can decide what you want to enable and what you want to disable. Let me illustrate that somehow else. So if I go to all layers and I click on all layers uh, and use layers, I see the layers that I'm using at the moment. And I see the same thing if I toggle between the, the layer groups. However, this time I can toggle what I want to show and what I want to hide. So. Let's start with the lighting plan. Um, do I need the dimensions? No, I'm just going to turn off the, the light bulb. Do I need the windows? No. Um, the furnishing? No. The lighting I need. The um, living room furnishing I don't need. And the, and the uh, living room lighting I need. Objects I do not need. The slab and the walls I do need. Actually, if there's something that you don't need but you know, you cannot turn this off because this layer is active. So you want to move this active marker to somewhere else. So let me just highlight another layer and make this an active one. And now I can turn this off. So this is one variation now. By clicking on this refresh button, I just designated that the lighting plan layer group has a certain set of layers that are enabled and disabled. Let's move on. Let's go to the furnishing plan. This time I'm going to disable the dimensions, uh, decor can be done, uh, furnishing interior, yes, lighting I do not need, furnishing I need, lighting I don't need, objects uh, I do not need, slabs, walls I do need. So again, refresh. Let's go with dimensions and plan. This time I do not need the, uh, the, the course, I'm just going to make another layer active. Uh, decor I don't need, uh, furnishing don't need, lighting, furnishing, lighting, object. So now I only want to have the walls and the dimensions. So I'm just going to hit OK. So if I click and toggle back and forth, I see that uh, now I have certain layer variations. And if I hit OK, well, seemingly one of the layer variations now just, now just took effect, which is the lighting plan. And actually, if I go down this way, I can designate what I want to uh, show and which variations I want to f want to hide. So if you, for example, want to visualize the furnishing plan with the walls only, then you can do that. If you want to visualize only the lighting plan, you can do that too. Moreover, if you select one of the, one of the variations and you click on the 3D hammer now, then the project is going to be rebuilt with all the things uh, missing, uh, let's go one step further. Let me just jump in into the into the location, and that way you can you can show or you can see that the lighting elements are now gone because I actually choose a uh, layer variation which doesn't have the lighting elements enabled. So that way you can quickly and easily filter the project content. So much about layers. If you have any questions, but I haven't answered about the layers, then please let me know. Uh, now is the part when we actually have to talk about you know handling complex projects but the question arises what does actually make a project complex so what does it depend on does it depend on the physical size does it depend on uh, on other things well it depends on a few things so for example one thing that that it depends on is the is the size oh by the way i see that there's a question about perspective so it's a very valid observation i have to talk about how i just created this uh, perspective and that is again a very important question if you want to create a complex project and complex documentation with it. So we already discussed layers. What about the three dimensional things that we see? For that, we need to have a perspective. Just a quick reminder, the software has two representation modes in general. One is called an axonometry, which is, um, it might be familiar to you from a geometry class when things you see in the distance would not 
shorten their distances. So even if you zoom in, you see that everything stays the same proportion as it, as it is. You would never able to enter this location no matter how far you zoom in. So this is not how, actually how human beings see. This is more like a graphical projection. If you want to go into a sort of imitation of what we actually see, you have to click on this eye icon and find something that we call it perspective. Because moving these markers, the software is able to designate what you see and what you do not see. Now, first of all, the th first thing I have to click on is the, the representation style, because if I have the top view, then, you know, I, I don't see anything. So instead I need to, so with this view, I'm not really helped. So I need to click on the 2D view. That way I can see exactly the, the floor plan view. So what do I do? I move my marker to where I want to stand and move my marker where I want to look at. And I just hit the plus icon and that way a view is created. I'm moving my marker again and another view is created when you hit the plus icon. Here is the huge problem. Imagine that you have multiple locations, multiple rooms and multiple floors. How would you be able to tell which view is which? Uh, the software is not going to name this for you. You have to do that. The rule that I like to follow is when I click on one of the views, I, I can I can rename it. And the first part of the name should be always uh, the the thing where you the, the place where you are. So this should be dining dining area number one. Okay, let's go for the second view. That should be dining area number two. And if I move my marker to the to the living room area and looking at to the looking to the other direction, maybe I'm going to move myself out from the corner because this uh, view makes no sense. So like that. Then I can just hit the plus icon again. Another view is created, but this time I have to name it living room number one. This way the software is able to lock things. So if you have multiple views, the software is always going to use an alphabetical order and order your views based on the names. One trick you can use if you want to make sure that the living room number uh, number one is ordered to the beginning is to add numbers to or numbers or or letters for your for your list zero one living room and now it's uh, it's ordered to the beginning so now I, I only want to I want to show this first and then this uh, has to be second so zero two dining area and zero three should be dining area number two. So that way you can organize your views. Obviously this makes more sense if you have more rooms, more locations, maybe more buildings. And that way you can easily organize and create the views. Let's hit okay. Returning back to what makes actually a project big and large. There are two things. Um, let's talk about first the physical size. So I'm just going to browse for the project that we are working on right now. And we are going to see the uh, sort of like this, this the storage need that this project has. So if I go to the relevant folders and I'm going to find the project that I'm working on, this uh, on that's on the D drive, um, here we go. So I see that this project currently takes up 27 megabytes uh, space on my hard drive. Is it is it a lot? Is it is it is it too much or is it too little? It depends what you actually want to create. Uh, before I answer that question, we have to investigate what reach this size. So what is in my project which is reaching this size? Well, there are two things uh, you... Actually, there are three things which makes a project large. One is the number of surfaces. Two is the number of materials. And three is the physical size. So it might happen that you have a large building which doesn't have too many uh, small items. Therefore, it doesn't have too many surfaces. So the building, even though it is physically large, it's not going to be a heavy project. However, if I have too many uh, surfaces in this project, maybe too many flowers, too many curtains, even this small one room uh, location could be a very heavy project. So that way, that means that you have to be very smart about how you are using your resources. You might ask me, Zoltan, does this mean that you should never use large or many surface items in, in a project? Uh, that doesn't, it, it doesn't uh, go that way. You always have to decide what is more important for you the number of surfaces in that particular scenario or the project's uh, consistency. But first we have to investigate how do we actually track the number of surfaces. You go to the 3D rebuild option and you go on this, uh, it's actually a build 3D model but you can recognize it with this, with this uh, wrench. Click on it. And this is actually where you can define how you want to build up your project. But this time we are mostly concerned about this number over here. That's the number of surfaces. 
okay, uh, 92,000. Is that a, is that a lot? Is that a, is it just a few? Well, base, basically, what I would like to use as a, as a rule of thumb is to try to keep the number of surfaces under one million. Because uh, if you are above a million, then you might get issues with your computer. If you are using a mid-range computer going above a million, that might cause problems. On my computer, I usually have projects around 50,000, 7,000, uh, uh, sorry, 500,000 or 700,000 surfaces. That, that's, still, that's still good. So try to keep this number low. Um, but how do I how do I keep this low? Because sometimes you end up with many surfaces and you want to sort of filter down your project. And for that, I have a very good example project. Let me just open up the file browser again and find another project that, that actually uh, answers this question. What happens if you have too many surfaces? Well, when you have too many surfaces, you end up with a very sloggy uh, workflow and you, don't, you do not want to do that. So let's uh, open up a new version of this project, which has a major design problem in it. I'm not sure if you would see right away, but I'm going to show you what we have to look for. Let's just wait until it loads up. Okay, seeming everything is normal here, nothing is falling apart, so I see that, you know, nothing to worry about here. However, when you are modeling things, you are sometimes ending up with uh, leftover three-dimensional bodies. What does that mean? Well, when you are using things like the... Uh, the uh, sketch mode or you are create you are downloading something from the 3d warehouse and you exploded that that item to, to million pieces you end up with unnecessarily existing three-dimensional bodies you need to know how to find them and how to get rid of them first let's discuss how to find them uh, if i go to the to the floor plan and now i'm opening up the the 3d hammer i see that this is interesting when i looked at the same project it was 92,000 surfaces. Now it's more than more than uh, 16. Actually, it, no, it's 165,000 surfaces. So why is that? Well, that is because we have many things in the project with which we don't see, but don't need. We have to purge them. So here's what we do. We click on the 3D hammer and we are going to build up the project, create a cutaway view, but make sure you select something which is not covering the project. And hit enter uh, okay this is weird you might say we haven't selected the project but still there's a bunch of objects appearing well these are not really your objects these are the evil twins of your pro of your objects these are not the things which are uh, in here these are more like leftover three-dimensional bodies which are just 3d solids but they are not doing anything to your project you could be deleting this and even if I delete this item like that you see that nothing changed on the floor plan, so I can delete this whole desk and nothing nothing changed, right? So this, this means that these are elements which are in your, in your project, but you don't need them. Well, if I don't need them, why should I delete them? Well, that's exactly the reason why you should delete them, because if you don't need them, they are making your project heavy without any reason whatsoever. So just highlight the whole bunch of evil objects or 3D solids and delete them. And now rebuild your project. And once we did that, we have to go to the uh, 3D rebuild menu and see how many surfaces we ended up with. Bang, it just went from 160 to 132. So this way you can filter down the things or purge the things that you don't need. So that is actually a very good practice for how to get rid of the, the things which are making your project heavy. But how do we even end up with these things? Well, for that, we are going to turn to the 3D warehouse and going to show you two scenarios when you are downloading something which is actually making your job more difficult than it has to be. So, the 3D Warehouse, by the way, is a direct connection to the Trimble 3D Warehouse where you can download content. Uh, make sure that you are logged in. I'm not sure I am. Yes, I am. There are two kinds of projects which you, sh which you should be avoiding. One is the kind of pro objects when it has too many surfaces. The other kind of object is when it has too many materials. Let's start with the the one with the number of surfaces. For that, uh, let's look for a chandelier, which I know is very, very difficult to handle. Zenith. Uh, I think it's a crystal chandelier like that. It doesn't fit the mo model itself, but you get the idea. So if I click on it, I see that the size is four megabytes and it has 60,000 polygons. Okay, that doesn't say much. So let me just download this first. 
Uh, the software is starting to download it. It asks me what kind of uh, lighting fixture I want this to be. Um, let, me, let me go to, uh, to, uh, to ceiling. And when I'm importing this, the software tells you that the complexity of the imported project or model uh, can cause speed problems. Do you wish to continue? So you can continue if you want, but you don't have to. So this is a warning that the software tells you that sure, you can import that, no problem but then it might cause problems later on. So why is the software actually asks you that? Well, that is because sometimes this is a value judgment. You need to decide if this chandelier is worth the trouble, if this is something that you actually need in your design, because if you could be using something else, something simpler in your project, then that's what you should be going for. That is to say, if you have a very small item on your project, which doesn't really have a purpose, then that doesn't have to be or doesn't need to be heavy. But if you are looking at something which is in a focal point of your project, then it can be heavier. It, it all depends on what you actually need. So I just imported this thing, um, thousands of surfaces, even on the 2D you can see that. So if I would go ahead and use this, that might cause speed problems on my, on my computer. So let me just highlight it and get rid of it. Oh, by the way, uh, let me just undo this. I want to show you that. So if I, if I undo the delete, deletion, I see that the number of surfaces skyrockets from uh, from 130,000 to, uh, to 200,000. So again, value judgment, whether that that is worth the trouble or not. So let me just delete it and go back here. And I see that now it jumped back. So 70,000 surfaces for this chandelier. I'm not sure it, it's worth it. So let's see another example. This time, the problem is not going to be with the surfaces. It's going to be with the materials. So let's find the material which I know is, is problematic. And that is called uh, kettle teapot. I think this is this is called a chinik. Uh, if I can boast with my Russian, there's nothing to boast with that. Um, okay, I'm going to download this as a SketchUp item, and again, once I import it, the software tells me this to this uh, teapot contains 290 materials. How did that happen? This is just a small teapot. Well, that is that just happened because the software, uh, the the teapot was created in a very strange way. That was, um, I think, that was a modeling problem with it. It's it's exploded into many many different surfaces, and and uh, the curves of the teapot are broken down for smaller polygons, and each and every polygon has a dedicated material attached to it, which means that many surfaces equals many materials. So. Even now, the software is still thinking about the import. Even though this object wasn't wasn't heavy, per se, it has many many materials. So, if you want, if you don't want to end up with that, please keep an eye on the number of surfaces and the number of materials. Another question, which is uh, which is pretty uh, straightforward, is how do you actually filter out the problematic parts, problematic objects? See now, even I think my software is going to give up on me because it has so many surfaces. Luckily, I have the uh, safety backup so i'm just going to go that path or i'm just going to uh, open up another uh, version of this project so again this is what you might be ending up with crashes or uh, or latency or sluggishness if you have too many objects and too much too many materials now going back to the to the project once the software just loads up i'm going to go to the 3d warehouse and show you where and how you can actually uh, filter down what you want to import see Again, the safety archive is there to save me, so that's a very handy tool. I love it. Let's go to interior and go to the 3D warehouse back and try to find something in your uh, for your design. Let's say I want to go for a, for a table. Simple, simple enough. So when you are looking for something, you add the name and here in the left hand side, you can filter down how many polygons you want to go for. Try to keep this below 50,000 or somewhere near to it. And the megabytes, that's something that, that you should be using to filter down the physical size, because if you if the physical size is large as well, then uh, you are going to have a difficult time. So again, these two sliders would help you to actually find the right content for your, for your design. If you're looking for something which would be very emphasized, you can go larger, of course. But if you're looking for something which would be just a tiny part of your project, then you should go uh, lower than that. Okay simple enough. Let's see what happens if the trouble has already happened and you ended up with many, many large things in the software, too many materials. How do you filter that down? Just to illustrate what we are doing here. 
the project we were working on was this 27 megabytes large project, but the one I'm, I'm importing now is 47 megabytes, which means that something major uh, just happened here. That is true, we have the chandelier and we have the problematic teapot, what I don't like because it has so many surfaces that just makes work much more difficult. Let me just go that way. So you see this tiny, tiny teapot has many, many surfaces and I don't need that for my work. So question is, how do I filter out the things that I don't need? You have to activate the 3D window. Let me just make it larger and go to uh, dimension, measure and list of elements. And that actually shows me the most problematic elements in my design. It lists the five, or I think that's, yeah, that's five uh, heavier, heaviest elements. I have the chandelier, the teapot, countertop, etc. So how do I get rid of this? Select it and click show selected item. I see that the item selected is now this chandelier. So I'm just going to go delete selected item. And now I just got rid of it. So let's go for the second one. That is a countertop. Uh, and I'm going to go for another one that is the, the cabinet. If you need it, keep it. But if you don't, then just delete it. So that way you can filter down what you want to, sh want to show and what, what you want to actually keep on your project. So every single element that you don't need can be purged. And that way the number of surfaces should be decreasing rapidly. So keep an eye on this number. And as long as you do, you shouldn't have any problems. Another question is, you are downloading these items and they are not only going to be stored in your uh, soft or in your project, but also in your design. So even though I deleted this chandelier, uh, I can still find it. So I can find it in my, my uh, design center, which is this a problem? Well, depends. If you want to use this chandelier in the future, then you might want to keep it. However, if you, if you are keep on storing everything in your design center, you're going to end up with a huge file folder, which is, which is going to, just eat up your, your hard drive. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is, is that you have every now and then you have to filter down the things that you have in your design center and get rid of them. How do I do that? I go to the object library and go to the Cogwheel icon. And here I have the ability to filter objects by their complexities. And if I do, the software tells me that, surprise, surprise, the chandelier wasn't the heaviest object in my library. Instead, it's a sofa. So you can review these elements and you can decide for your own if this is something that is, is worth keeping or not. Uh, I want to uh, keep this. I want to keep that as well. Uh, well, this industrial thing I don't want to keep. Uh, maybe this one uh, not either. Uh, I think that is too heavy for my purposes. This bicycle, it makes no sense to keep it. So whenever you have like a palette of things you want to delete, you just hit delete all and they are going to be deleted from your from your uh, design center and that way you are going to save space valuable space on your hard drive so that again is a is a countermeasure for, so as not to not to get too heavy so get rid of the things that you don't need okay that is for the objects what happens for materials well that can be deleted in a different way so let's go back to the design center and go to materials and click on in model now I see that these are all the materials what I have in my model, there's a, there's a lot of them. So that is interesting. These are the materials for my teapot, but the teapot is already deleted. So how do I delete all the materials? Well, there's a tool for that as well. First of all, you have to be extremely cautious about what you want to delete because now you have 696 um, items in this library and this many uh, materials and we want to delete the ones that we are not currently using. But if I use this tool, what I'm about to show you, everything would be deleted, which is not used, which if that's what you wanted is a good tool. But if that's, if you know, you keep wanting to use these elements, these uh, materials later on, then that's not what you should be doing. So let's go for file, say project as, and click on this purged, uh, purge unused materials, which are not applied on the floor plan and the 3D model, which, which means these elements. So we are expecting to go down from the 700 elements to way, way less. So let's click save and save this as a living room and the name would be purged. I'm saving it and now I'm just going to reload it and we are going to see how many surfaces I end or how many materials I end up with. Just one second. So I'm just going to uh, go to 93. So if I go back to materials, 
and I go to in model, I see that from the 696 elements, 93 were deleted. So what remains is actually the, the ones that I'm actually using. So if I go to the file manager and I see the project, I see that that one, uh, that one was uh, the one that I was using, the large one. And now I have the purge one for 15 megabytes. So with these clever tools, you can, uh, you can quickly and effectively manage your project content. Just a quick recap of what we discussed today. Uh, first of all, always try, always start your day with, uh, with a manual save and every now and then do a save. The software does have automated backups, but that is only a fail safe, uh, just, in, just in case of emergency uh, kind of measure. So rely on that only when you have to. The other thing I discussed is using layers. Now I know that working in layers might be scary, but believe me, if you get used to the used to using layers, then uh, you end up with a much more efficient workflow, especially when it comes to using layer variations, with which you can visualize your project from different viewpoints. Speaking of viewpoints, I also discussed the perspectives, which is about uh, how to visualize the the three dimensional space. So. I showed you how to effectively name and organize your views. Then we talked about what makes a project heavy and difficult to handle. There are three things you have to keep an eye on. One is the number of surfaces. The other is the number of uh, materials. And the third thing is the, the size itself. But honestly, the first two are the most difficult ones. Surfaces and materials. I showed you how not to end up with a difficult situation, how not to import uh, difficult uh, hand things that are difficult to handle. And I also showed you how to filter down the project content and get rid of and purge the things that you don't need. Now let's uh, let's look at the questions. Now it's question time. That's the thing I like the most about these shows. Um, question: You are increasing the number of yeah. That thank you, Kim. So for the uh, for those uh, syntax freaks out there, when you when you have open and save and you are uh, you are increasing this number, then you are increasing the number to decrease the frequency. Thank you. Uh, always good to learn something new. That just fries my mind when I think about the logic behind it. Uh, question. I can see that the problem with importing the three from the 3D warehouse is uh, corrected now. That is true. Uh, you have to know that the 3D warehouse that we connect to is, uh, is made and maintained by the company, the US-based company called Trimble, which are making uh, geo-survey software products and, and, and uh, devices. Every now and then when they have a new addition or a, a new update to their 3D warehouse, the connection between Archline and the 3D warehouse might be broken, which we are very fast to correct. However, if for, for whatever reason uh, the connection is not there, then you can still download things from the 3D warehouse, save them to your hard drive, and then import them as an SKP file into the software. That is the workflow that you should be always following if that happens. So if the 3D warehouse is not connecting, just do the other way. Um, okay, there's another question. Is there a way to simplify uh, surfaces, objects within the model? Well, actually, if you are, um, well, one thing that you could be using is uh, something that we call the sketch mode. I think I'm going to show you with this. So let's say that I like the, the vase but I don't need the flowers. The flowers give too many surfaces. I, I select the item and I enter in something that I call the sketch mode. And when I do, I can get rid of the things which, uh, which I don't need for this item. For example, I don't need the flowers. So I'm just going to select the petals, the flower bits and leaves maybe. So that way I end up with the, with the vase itself. So if, I, if that is the thing I want, then I'm just going to say a new object uh, select all and I'm just going to say that this is going to be a vase 001 uh, it should go for the 3d warehouse folder and that is one way to sort of get rid of the things that you that you don't need uh, simplify elements uh, if you have maybe a difficult uh, pillow with many surfaces, there's no way to simplify that. But if you want to cut things out of your model, then you can do that. So for example, it should be, I think it was 001 or something like that. Uh, maybe those of you out there can remember what the name was. Yeah, here we go. So now I have another version which doesn't have the flower in it. So it's always a value judgment. Uh, define and decide what you need and what you don't need. Uh, another, another idea or another um, tool 
for example, if you have this pillow and you want to make it less wrinkly, there's no way to do that. So it's your call if you want to keep this, or maybe you want to re uh, replace it with a, with a lower resolution uh, item. Uh, another thing that could be useful for certain tools in the software, um, maybe for, um, let me think that for a second, for let's say when you have, have, when you have a sweep tool, uh, you can define the resolution of the things that you are creating. So when you're creating a new item, maybe a cornicing or, or other things, then you can decide how detailed you want that to be. But uh, again, that is not entirely an, an answer to your question, but more often than not, you can define how detailed you want things to show unless that thing is something that you imported. Another question. Uh, yeah, thanks, I have learned a lot and found out why sometimes my projects were crashing. Well, that was the whole point. So today was not really about modeling, it was more about, more about the, the administrative thing. So how to handle the things that you have created because Honestly, if you lose your project because you have uh, you have a heavy element in in them, then that that is a problem. And without sounding sounding apologetic, this is not something which is special to Arch9. That goes for any kind of modeling software. If you have heavy surfaces, too many materials, then you are going to make your work much more difficult. One thing I haven't told you, um, and that circles back to the layer variations. I showed you how to use the variations to to sort of filter down the content. But one thing you could be using this for is to hide the things that you don't want to show in the rendering. So it's not only good for printing out layouts, but also for hiding things that you don't want to render. I said that before, I say it again, when you do renderings, try to hide everything that you don't want to render. Otherwise the software is going to spend time on rendering things that you don't actually see. Question, is there a possibility to simplify an object directly in ArchLine uh, in terms of surface count? Uh, that is the almost the same question as before. Uh, no, not in this regard. So not in the way you think about that, no. Uh, what you can do is that you can explode objects, uh, extract things from that, but you don't. You cannot make a wrinkly pillow less wrinkly, if that is the answer to your question. And that is what we wanted to discuss today. Uh, I always say we, because usually we make these shows together with, with Ilish. He is not here, obviously, because I'm working from home office, but uh, on Friday, you are going to meet him again when he talks about, I think, uh, railings and staircases. But tomorrow, we talk about uh, cabinetry. I already had a show on uh, cabinet design. I showed you how to create uh, very simple cabinet pieces, but tomorrow I go one step further and I'm going to show you what happens if you have curved worktops or you have built-in appliances. So if you have Watch and enjoy the show on kitchen design. Make sure you stay uh, tuned tomorrow as well, where we talk about similar things, but a bit more advanced. If there was any questions I haven't asked, I haven't answered, then please uh, send me an email about them. And uh, if you like the show, what you have seen today, like the video and subscribe to our channel. And otherwise, I see you tomorrow. And until then, happy designing. Oh, one thing to add, if you haven't done so, uh, please go to the website and download the webinar course content. And that way you can follow along and make your homework and do the same thing that I just did. See you tomorrow.